Originally released in 2001, the iPod was a massive hit and saw many hardware revisions up until 2015. Today, in honor of the birthday of the late Steve Jobs, I'll be taking a look at the three iPods I own. In 2019, how do these antiquated machines hold up? iPod. A thousand songs in your pocket. First, we have the iPod Photo from 2004. This was touted as a premium version of the iPod 4, which introduced color displays to the lineup. 15 hours of battery for music playback was quite impressive, but running a slideshow with music would only provide about 5 hours. The hard drive came in many sizes. The unit I have here is a 40GB model. You wake it up by pressing any of the buttons on the front. To view your music, you have the standard options such as artist, album, and songs, but by album is my favorite way. There are also several other ways to view your collection, but I don't use them to be honest. When filling out information in iTunes, I don't even add the details such as composers or genre. Speaking of which, with no internet to speak of and no physical way of loading music, such as a CD, music is added through iTunes on your computer. The music can come from almost any source, including a ripped CD, your purchases on the iTunes store, or absolutely perfectly legitimate sources online. To be serious for a moment, it is likely that a large amount of people still using iPods today will choose to get their media online, which is already a gray area I don't want to get involved in. But seeing how popular it is, I might as well cover it. Using this technique, once you have acquired your music file, you will also need to download the album artwork and find other information about the song that you don't already know. These files can now be put together in iTunes, so in adding music in bulk, this can take a little time. Next, we connect the iPod to the computer. The only cable I have is old and finicky, and my local Apple store wants $20 for a new one, which is also the price of the lightning cable if you get the shortest one. Because of this, I have had my iPod randomly disconnect while syncing, which causes the unit to freeze, and in some cases, iTunes will freeze too. Even if you force quit iTunes and disconnect the cable, you can then continue to use the computer normally until you turn it off, which may result in it freezing with the spinning wheel. I should note that this ordeal isn't very common, and could be avoided by using a new cable entirely, and probably a newer Mac too, but nonetheless, it is a risk that I feel obligated to mention. The 95% of the time it does work is great, and songs sync in just seconds, so... How well does a dedicated music device work in 2019? I've actually been using this since late 2018, and have had few problems. This has only happened to me two times, but it was scary and annoying, so I'll mention it anyway. When navigating the menus quickly, and quickly pressing buttons, the iPod freezes sometimes. After rebooting, which can be done by holding menu and the center button, all of the files seem to be erased, and it took several more restarts before the hard drive woke up and showed me my collection. This is sadly what happens to too many old mechanical hard drives. With time, it becomes harder to spin the platters and to read with the head. It is quite popular to open up original iPods and replace the elderly spinning drives with a solid state solution, but I personally love the feeling of the iPod vibrating ever so slightly in my hand when starting a song, and the noise, while impressively quiet, is somewhat charming. It gives this old silver brick a little bit of personality. I've mainly stated the disadvantages to the iPod in this video so far, but there are a lot of things it still does right in the modern day. While this 40GB version would have cost $500 in 2004, I picked this up on eBay for $25, and considering that's more than my iPhone SE can hold, the iPod starts to become a smart choice. If you put music, videos, games, etc. on your phone, it fills up quickly, which is why a device for only music starts to make sense. It's a cheap and effective little music device, and especially if you're really into music, having a dedicated device is a good call. Nobody is going to try to call you in the middle of your favorite song. So if you are in a situation where you want to be free from distractions but keep your music, an iPod is a great idea for you. Such an old, single-use device is clearly not ideal for everyone, but if you are fond of Apple, classic technology, or music, I'd recommend picking this one up. They are extremely ideal for hobbies such as exercising or puzzles, anything that requires concentration or prohibits looking at your phone. Of the three iPods I own, I use this one the most, and yes, I do use it daily. The original iPod Touch was released in 2007, the same year as the first iPhone. 
The purpose was to provide a cheap and contract-free way to experience the new iOS. Unlike the iPhone, the iPod Touch had no cellular capabilities, no camera, no physical volume buttons, and no speaker, aside from the beeper speaker, for system noises, like the iPod Classic line had. The unit was thinner than the iPhone, but had most of the same features. Both devices came in either 4 or 8 gigabytes. The App Store for systems on iOS 2 or higher. Both had Wi-Fi, identically sized glass displays, and the list goes on. Adding music is the same as the iPod Classic, but errors are less common. I don't believe I've even encountered one. You can also download directly from the iTunes Store with no computer required. This time, when viewing songs by album, the album's artwork is displayed on the menu. Technically, you can still use the internet, but it's painstakingly slow, and almost always has some sort of error waiting behind every corner. I don't recommend browsing the internet with this. The same can be said for the YouTube app. Side note, if you remember the YouTube icon looking like a TV like I do, hats off to you. I don't have much to say about this one because it's similar enough to our phones today, and it shouldn't need much of an introduction. Should you buy one? It's harder to recommend due to the limited storage space, but it does make for a cool collection piece. The larger and brighter display may also provide less battery than the iPod Classic, but if the Classic interested you, this one may also be good for its solid state storage and hence greater reliability. Finally, the iPod Touch Generation 4. All my friends and I owned these back in third grade and they were such a blast. The Touch 4 was the first of any iPod line to have speakers. It also featured front and rear facing cameras, the first Touch to do so. The front facing cam is exclusive to the Touch line, but the Nano also sported a rear facing camera. The quality of these cameras is pretty lackluster by today's standards. But hey, a cheap way to use FaceTime in 2010? Why not? Of the three iPods I've shown today, this one was the most capable in 2019. It's not as fast as our iPhones today, even the 6 can outperform it, but it's surprising just how snappy it is online. Even YouTube and Instagram work. But the question is, for how long? Only so many apps can run on iOS 6, but as of now, it's a cool little toy. Of all the models shown in this video, if you don't like the idea of a single purpose device, I'd recommend this one. Syncing and downloading music is the same as the last one, but if you really wanted to, you could technically stream on here. Of course, if functionality is your wish, you can buy a brand new 6th generation on Apple's website right now, or wait until later this year where the rumored refresh will come out. But to be honest, if that's how you feel, you could probably get along fine with your current phone alone. But if you really want a second device, an old phone is okay too, especially if you upgrade often. For the rest, if you really care about the iPod line, a classic is definitely the coolest and most historically important one. But if all you want is music and don't want to fiddle with dying hard drives or anything, a shuffle will always do. You've just seen some pictures of Macintosh. Now I'd like to show you Macintosh in person. All of the images you are about to see on the large screen will be generated by what's in that bag. This video is being released today, February 24th, on the birthday of the late Steve Jobs. He would have been 64 today, in 2019. He sadly passed away in 2011. While Apple today is no doubt different for better or worse, using old products from the time when he was in charge always feels different from using modern Apple products. Yes, the older and slower hardware is part of it, but Steve's designs have a certain feel to them that I don't think anyone will be able to duplicate for a long time, which is why people like me still use the iPod Classic and why collecting and restoring old Macs is such a great hobby with an even better payoff. Steve's ideas and products always felt important, and they should live on.